Well, revelations of that spying program prompted US lawmakers from both sides of the political divide to try to restrict their government's collection of electronic information. However, the vote was narrowly defeated in the House of Representatives. To discuss the political response to the surveillance program, we're joined by James Marone. He's a professor of political science at Brown University, an award-winning author, and a visitor at the U.S. Study Center at the University of Sydney. Welcome to you. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, as mentioned, a legislative attempt to block further funding of this NSA program, uh, which gathers phone records, electronic records, uh, saw an unusual coalition of conservatives and uh, Liberal Democrats. How would you describe that grouping? What are they trying to achieve? It's, first of all, it's an extraordinarily unusual coalition. Americans are a little dizzy by this. The far right, the not so far right, and the left come together, and in both cases, they're challenging their own leadership, both President Obama for the Democrats and the House leadership for the Republicans. So this is a very interesting, very slow-moving story, which we'll be seeing a lot more of in the, in the days and months to come. Do you think that reflects the mood in America? Perhaps the citizens there are conflicted, perhaps even ambivalent. Uh, about this NSA program? Absolutely. About 52% of the public is saying, oh, well, if that's what we need to keep ourselves safe, well, okay, go on then. And a, a smaller but very intense minority, uh, somewhere between 35 and 40%, are saying, good heavens, what are you doing in our name? So we have a very strong group very worried about this massive data collection and a majority that seems to be not too fussed about it. And we're watching as the public opinion shifts, but the leadership on both the Democrats and the Republicans, that is, uh, within the, the, the House of Representatives, are very agitated about all this. So, first of all, what's interesting is they even got the vote. So, here's the hidden part of the story that hasn't, hasn't been told. It looks, on the face of it, like a rebellion. House members get up, we must have a vote, they vote, and they come within seven votes of defunding this thing. Both President Obama and the House leadership says, no, 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 we don't want this. But neither President Obama nor the House leadership, Republicans and Democrats, neither one of them fought very hard. So they themselves seem a little ambiguous as well. Is it fair to say a majority of Americans are still buying this argument that in the post 9-11 world, uh, that sacrifices, uh, sacrificing a measure of privacy is necessary uh, to maintain national security? Yes. Asterix. Many people haven't really thought this through. So they are buying it, just as you said, but they haven't thought about it much. If, if you look at the intensity levels in public opinion polls, what we're seeing is people are just scratching their heads and puzzling it out. It's one of those really quite rare events for a top news story. Most people aren't quite sure what they think yet. So a very flexible, fluid situation for us. We've even seen an author of the, the Bush, or part uh, author of the Bush Patriot Act, um, Republican Jim uh, Sensenbrenner. Uh, he said it's time to stop harvesting uh, phone records. It's, if you go through who's on the uh, opposition side to these records, it's really quite a remarkable coalition. People who you would expect from their past behavior to be quite supportive. And the general betting is when this law expires in 2015, there's going to be some very fundamental changes. How, how fundamental? That depends on public opinion. So how would you describe the president's stance on this? Has he been pragmatic? The president wakes up every morning and spends the first half hour with a general being told all the places in the world where there might be an attack. And it seems his supporters believe that's gotten inside his head. He is trying very hard to balance the scary list of reports with legal action. What everybody says, even his supporters, is well, okay, he's relatively careful, but what happens when the next guy comes in? And if you've got this huge apparatus, isn't it a little bit scary when someone a little less careful is in charge? Well, the next guy or woman uh, comes in in about three and a half years' time. Uh, in that time that Obama has left, what does he stand for? What's his agenda? We live still in the United States in the shadow of Ronald Reagan. The idea that government is, if not bad, certainly not good. I think what Obama is going to do in the next two and a half years, 
not going to get much through Congress. What he's going to try to do is become the Democrat, Democratic Reagan. That is to begin to say, you know what? We need government for a lot of things. And we've got to stop simply saying, hey, government is bad. You know Americans like most of the programs that come their way. Let's take stock and rethink our reflexive anti-governmentalism. Well, a part of the problem, of course, is the stumbling block of the Republicans versus the Democrats in trying to overcome the debt ceiling and negotiate on the budget. How does he get past that, the partisan politics? That's the big story. So you saw today, as you were announcing the, the headlines, that Obama is already out on the stump. Now, if you follow American politics closely, you know Obama has been skunked, as we say, in the United States. He's lost the debate each time. He he goes into the arguments thinking, well, I have the high ground. People love the big programs like Medicare and Social Security. He comes up against the Republicans, and somehow in the last two years, he comes out looking kind of badly. So how you should read these, uh, these speeches that Obama's given is his people have finally told them, look, Barack, get out ahead of the story. People like their programs. The Republicans themselves are in a fierce debate within their own party. You try to shape the story ahead of it because there's going to be big battles in the next six months. This is often shaped as a question of leadership. Now, Australians bemoan the quality of leadership uh, in this country. Do, do the Americans feel the same way? And I take, for example, Anthony Weiner, uh, who we've heard oh. in the last couple of days, running for mayor of New York, again caught out uh, having an online affair, sexting, how important is moral rectitude for politicians I, I in the United States? I love this story. <laughs> and moral rectitude is really quite important, but there's a way, you know, as, as, as all Puritans know, and America is the land of Puritans, as all Puritans know, what happens when you've slipped is you go in front of the cameras, if they've been invented yet, and you say, I have fallen, I'm, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, give me another chance. Wiener played it perfectly. He apologized, he put the sackcloth on, ashes over his head, and lo and behold, New Yorkers said, okay, give you another chance. Well, it worked for Bill Clinton, but this is taking it a step further, surely. Yes. So you, you, you do everything right, you get out in front, he's leading in the polls of the... And then it comes up all over again. Surely once you've begged forgiveness, you stop the behavior. And I have to tell you, Andrew, I've, I've seen some of these texts. You just want to brush your teeth after them. <laughs> James Moroni, thanks very much. Thanks. A pleasure to be here, Andrew.